Hello, everybody, and welcome to part two of the angle plate demonstration on the milling machine for Machining 210. Um, in the last video, we got this head and the vise tram to the machine, and so now we're ready to move on to um, actually squaring up a block, which is very exciting. Uh, we've got this block right here. This is just our uh, raw stock that we cut off uh, from a longer piece of uh, rectangular bar. Uh, we did it on the bandsaw. So it ended up being, let's see, this is two and a half by two inch stock and then we cut it off to about two and a quarter. Okay, so that's gonna be our, um, that's gonna be our material. We've already labeled this. Um, so uh, if you're looking for the labeling scheme, then you know, just go ahead and watch the uh, lecture video and it'll show you how to how to actually uh, mark everything. Um, so the next step is to actually start cutting stuff. Uh, I'm going to be zooming in in just a moment, um, but I wanted to let you see sort of everything that I'm working on. Um, so of course, we've got the vise. This is the spindle where we're gonna put our tools. Um, these are the table locks right here. I'll be using the table locks at certain points during this process. Um, there are some locks on the knee as well, but uh, we don't really need to use that because the knee is so heavy um, that it usually doesn't need to be locked. Um, this is the quill lock right here. Okay, so that's very important. Um, here is where we go from high to low. Uh, this is for the quill feed. So actually this, this, this and this are all for the quill feed um, that we'll use like in the second semester for the NIMS bench block uh, or the NIMS step block. Uh, but we're not gonna use it for this project. So actually better to just go ahead and disengage it. So this is the disengage position here. So this is engage, disengage. Just go ahead and leave it disengaged. Um, so this is where we're gonna be setting the spindle speed. Um, one quick note on this, this is a, um, it's actually a variable speed pulley. Um, and so it's, it has uh, essentially the two, cone, the, uh, the two pulleys are made from opposing cones. And uh, the way that you change the speed is by uh, moving the cones further apart and moving the cones further into each other. And that will change effectively the size of the pulley. So there are two of those in there and you change the, the ratio between diameters of the pulley sort of on the fly. Um, using this little handle right here. Um, but because of the mechanism that's used, you really have to adjust the speed when the spindle is on. So it's a little counterintuitive because on the lathes, for example, uh, with geared heads, you really have to adjust the speed when the spindle is off. Otherwise, you run the risk of destroying the gears. Um, but here, you actually must do it when the spindle is on. Otherwise, you could uh, break the belt or you could change the position of the uh, basically, you could change it so that the RPM on this um, uh, scale here doesn't correspond to the actual position of the pulley anymore, if that makes any sense, so that the scale could be off. So there are a number of things that could happen there. Uh, it actually has a little sign right here on the side that says, caution, do not adjust, sorry, do not turn unless motor is running. So yeah, follow the directions. Let's see. Uh, this is the spindle on-off over here. And actually, there's a high range, low range, what it calls high range, low range. Um, but actually, what happens is that when you go from high to low over here, what you're doing is you're adding and subtracting a gear. So if, you know, just basic mechanical aptitude, if you've got two gears uh, meshing with each other, if this one's rotating this way, of course, the other one's going to rotate the other direction, right, in order for them to mesh. So if this one's going... Let's see, from your angle, that's going uh, clockwise. If this one's going clockwise, this one's going counterclockwise. Well, what happens if you add a third gear? That third gear is going to be rotating the same direction as the first one, right? And so that's what's happening here. Um, and so uh, what, you know, the, the direction that the spindle actually rotates is going to change. The, the direction that the spindle rotates is going to change whether you're in high or low gear. So this high range, low range down here, that actually changes the direction that the motor rotates. Um, so what is going to spin the tool clockwise 
which is typically the correct direction that we want. Like if we're looking down the spindle at the tool, we, should, we want it to be spinning clockwise. Um, which one of these selections right here on the motor on off switch is going to be dependent on whether or not we're in high or low gear. I hope that makes sense. Basically what you have to do is you just use your eyes. You make sure that it's spinning the correct direction. Many people spin the tools the wrong direction and end up blowing the inserts out or destroying the cutting edges. So you really need to uh, pay attention to this. Okay, another thing that I just want to point out. Uh, so this handle right here adjusts the y-axis, what we call the y-axis. Um, this handle over here, and there's another one on the other side over here. This one adjusts the x-axis, okay? Um, and then down here, we've got a power feed. And actually, well, we have a power feed on the quill, and we have a power feed on the x-axis, and those are the only two that we get. Some machines actually have uh, more uh, power feeds than that. They have power feeds on the y, power feeds on the knee. Uh, but we just have a power feed on the X, which is pretty common. Uh, in order to engage it, you pull the lever that way, you pull the lever that way, um, and you can adjust the speed with this knob right here. These numbers don't actually correspond to anything, like in terms of feed rate in inches per uh, minute or anything like that. Um, but uh, as I'll show you in a moment on the digital readout, we do have a readout for the uh, inches per minute feed rate. It's just not directly on this knob. This is just like a volume knob, right? Volume knobs don't tell you decibels or anything like that. It's just, it goes from 0 to 10, sometimes to 11. All right, so if we engage this, there's this little button right here, the little blue, um, you know, LED lit button. If you press that, then you get a rapid movement. Now that's really useful for rapid positioning right, to get a tool where it needs to be in order to start a cut, but you never want to use that to cut, right, that's just too fast, okay. Um, there's also, uh, some people don't know this, but there's a little switch right there that turns the power feed on and off. Sometimes that needs to get reset, it works a little bit like a fuse, so sometimes if the motor gets overloaded, then you may have to uh, flip that switch uh, just to get it working again, okay? Now, uh, these handles have dials here and here, just like uh, the, you know, the lathe might have a dial or does have a dial on the, on the cross feed, for example. Um, but we're not really going to be using this. We're just going to rely on the digital readout. So these are kind of pointless. Um, however, we are going to be using the dial on the knee. So this is the handle right here for the, uh, the crank for the knee. So if we want to move the knee up like this, if we want to move the knee down, we turn it counterclockwise like this. Okay, usually I'll just remove it or I'll just flip it around backwards. That way I don't accidentally run into it or anything uh, and accidentally ch change my reading or you know, hit myself uh, in an uncomfortable place. Um, so if you want to change the reading on the dial, there's this little knurled ring right here. You just have to back that knurled ring off, and then the dial can rotate freely. There's a little chisel mark right there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and you line up the zero with that chisel mark and then just screw that little knurled jam nut back down. And now you've, you've recorded your position. So it's just like the lathe, right? You've recorded your position here. Uh, backlash is less of an issue on this particular uh, setting because the knee is so heavy that it pretty much always sits in the same spot on the lead screw, the lead screw that's just underneath the table right there. Actually, you can see the pedestal right there that it comes out of, okay? Um, but you should still be mindful of uh, backlash. So as you go up to a number, if you go a little bit too far, um, go back down and then come back up to that number that you wanted again. Don't just like, if you go too far, don't just back it off a few thousands because uh, you might get an inaccuracy in your reading. Okay, so that's pretty much it there. Okay, and like I said, I just wanted to show you um, the digital readout and the uh, feed rate adjustment. So when I start off the table moving in one direction, you can see that there's a little number right here. It says FR. FR for feed rate, 
and then six, and that's given in inches per, uh, inches per minute. So if I increase the speed, that number goes up. Right now it's at around 15, and if I slow it down, now it's only at three inches per minute. Okay, so that's what we're actually gonna be using um, to tell the feed rate. And all these digital readout, or I think we have like three different models of digital readout on all these different machines. So um, they're all pretty similar, um, but just slightly different. Okay, but they should have a feed rate readout on them. In order to use the digital readout, uh, really there are, you know, other than the, the feed rate here, let me just show you the feed rate again a little bit closer. So you can see the feed rate there changing a little bit as I change the speed on the table. Nothing super fancy there. Um, the other two things that we're going to be looking at for are our X position, sorry, X position. Wait, which one is X? Aha, this one is X and this one is Y. Okay, so that's actually going to be giving, it takes, it replaces the, the dials that we have on the handles, okay? And there's, there's really, uh, well, I don't want to say no, but there's a negligible amount of backlash uh, in these digital readout settings. Um, and so you can see as I turn the, the uh, handle for the table, it changes the value here and it goes out to, so that's four decimal places. So the tenth of a thousandth of an inch, although I think the resolution is only two tenths of a thousandth of an inch. Yeah, it goes in two tenths of a thousandth of an inch. Okay. So what we can do with this is we can set a position. So let's go ahead and say that I found the edge of my part, like right there. I hit that button, boom, it zeroes it out. Nice. Uh, and then if I move the, uh, the Y axis, Okay, you can see that that also moves, and I can zero that out as well. Um, this one right here is actually for the quill. So as I move the quill up and down, okay, we can also zero that out. It would be nice if we had a digital readout on the knee itself, uh, but we don't. Okay. Um, that's pretty much all we need to know about the digital readout. That's as much of its capabilities we're going to be using for this project. Okay, but I did want to go through that. Okay, so now it's time to mount the Octomil um, uh, because this is what we're going to be using for five out of the six sides on the part. So I am going to show you what a messed up cutter does when you try to cut with it. Okay, and then we'll switch to the cutter that has the good inserts in it. Okay, but I did just want to show you this. So let me go ahead and show you this up close before I actually install it into the spindle, just so you can see what I mean by messed up. So that right there, so, so you can see these are the little inserts, the little tungsten carbide inserts right there. Um, and those, uh, you can see the set screw in there, that just gets clamped into the body. Um, using a special type of um, screwdriver called a, uh, well, it has a Torx driver on it, T-O-R-X. It's that sort of star-shaped driver that's in there. Um, and uh, there are four of them, and these are pretty well beat up. You can see that in the corners, they are chipped, it looks like, and in any case, anything that's not chipped is very, very worn. So actually, probably what happened here is that somebody ran this backwards, and it doesn't cut backwards. It's really only designed to cut forwards like this. It's not designed to cut backwards. That'll just blow the inserts up, okay? But let's try cutting with it and see what it does. It cannot be overstated how important it is that this taper on the, uh, on the shank of the cutter and this taper inside of the spindle are very, very clean, okay? Anytime you get too, ooh, oily. Anytime you put two very uh, precision surfaces together and then you clamp them together, um, if there's any little bit of dirt, a chip, anything, even stuff that you wouldn't typically recognize, um, it can do extreme damage to both of the surfaces. Um, it'll wallow out little craters and push material around and make it impossible for this to register accurately. Uh, and so then the tool is going to be spinning around, or sorry, it's not going to be, it's going to be doing more than just spinning. It's going to be wobbling around, like revolving around the center rather than just rotating around the center. 
Um, and it's going to make it very difficult to make good parts that way. And so we have to take good care of these tools, and especially good care of the spindle, because that's really difficult to replace. Okay? Now, on here, there's like a little keyway, um, and that keyway is supposed to fit up to a little key in the spindle. Actually, it's, it's actually just like a set screw. Um, and this one, yep, it seems like this one has been sheared off. Uh, because somebody either over torqued this thing, I mean like they, they ran the cutter too hard and it sheared the pin off, or they just put it in the incorrect location and that, I don't know what happened here. So the point is you got to line up the keyway with the key, otherwise you could damage both the keyway and the key. So something happened here. So I'm going to do my best to get it lined up. Okay, so that just fits up in there like that. Okay, and then there's a draw bar up here. Oh, probably need to be a little bit higher here so I can get better access to the draw bar. And you're just gonna rotate that in by hand so that the screw engages. Okay, so now it's being held by the back side with the screw. And then you just get that hand tight. Okay, and then we're gonna give it just a little bit more gronk. It takes a three-quarter inch wrench, and I use the brake right here and turn it. It doesn't need to be like gorilla tight, but it should be pretty tight. Okay, good. Now, one thing I have to mention is that the brake doesn't work when you're in neutral. Okay, but it will work in high and low. I'm going to go ahead and put this in high. Uh, because I know that I'm going to have to spin this at 1400 RPM, or 1386, about 1400 RPM. So, uh, so there we go. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on, okay, and then I'm going to adjust the speed to 1400. Now, one thing that's really important is that when you're changing gears, actually I should say when you're going from low to high gear, it's very, very, very important that you make sure that that gear has dropped into place, that the gears are actually in mesh. Because if you don't do that and you turn the spindle on, then it's just going to start grinding out. So I'm going to put this into, so right now I'm in neutral. Now, right, I just put it up into the high position, but I, am I actually in high? I don't know. Now I'm going to do something that I shouldn't do, but I want you to hear what it sounds like. That's awful. Don't do that. Here's how you get away from grinding the gears. Okay. So here you are in neutral. You want to put it up into high. How do you verify that you're actually in high? Go ahead and rotate the cutter by hand until you can hear an audible click. Let's see if we can pick this up on the microphone. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Now I can turn it on without it making that horrible, horrible grinding noise. Very good. Okay, so here's the uh, motor on off switch, right? And there's actually like a uh, high range, low range, or sometimes it says forward and reverse. Um, but actually, uh, that's meaningless, right? Because really, it depends on uh, the, whether you're in high, high gear or low gear and the direction that you want to spin your cutter. Okay, so it's all a little bit relative, but basically you've got two options here and here, and it just reverses the motor direction, which then will re reverse the, uh, the direction that the spindle rotates. Um, so again, I'm going to just turn this on to whatever, and then I'm going to use this handle here, move the speed around. Uh, so I want it at 1400 RPM. Yep, so right around there. Um, if you're in high speed, then this is the readout that you look at, right? It's the rabbit, which is faster than the turtle, or tortoise, hare, tortoise, rabbit, turtle. Um, and so if you're in low gear, then this is what you're going to be reading for the RPM, okay? So here we're set. Now let me just go ahead and zoom in on the cutter so that you can see which direction it rotates. Okay, so now we're looking at the cutter. And I'm going to move to the uh, up position on the motor on-off switch. Uh, and so that's in the quote-unquote high range position. And let's see what it does. Okay, so you can see 
it's rotating clockwise. If we're looking down at the spindle like this, and it's spinning clockwise in this direction, and that's actually what we want. You can see that the cutting edges are the things that are leading, right? But if I move to the quote unquote low range position, the down position, yikes. Right, so now actually we're leading with the back of the cutting edge here, right? So that's not gonna do anything except for blow the inserts up and potentially destroy the, uh, the cutter itself. So don't do that, okay? Now if I move to the uh, low range, now let me go to the high range again on the motor switch, so that's the up position. Whoa, it's rotating the opposite direction. Go figure. So now if I move it to the lower position, the quote unquote low range position, now it's traveling the correct direction, that clockwise direction, okay? Most of these cutters are uh, designed to spin clockwise, um, but not all of them, not all of them, especially some of the fly cutters that we'll use uh, are oriented backwards, all right? But I just want you to make sure that you keep an eye out for this. Make sure that you do a visual inspection to make sure that this is spinning the correct direction. Uh, it really will minimize the number of damage tools that we have. Okay, now it's time to go ahead and put the part into the vise and take a cut. Just to let you know, I am following the um, project planning worksheet. This is uh, step number three, so uh, go ahead and follow along if you've got one. You should have one. First thing to do is just make sure that the vise is really, really clean. Um, you can clean it with a towel or something like that, but again, a really good test is just to check it with, uh, with your hands. Make sure everything is nice and clean. There are a number of different tools that you can use to actually tighten the vise down. Um, so you can just use a three quarter inch wrench or we have these proper vise handles that have a, a swivel on them. Or you can use this, it's called a speed handle. Um, if you use something like this, just know that because the distance from the, uh, the pivot to where you're actually uh, putting torque on the nut uh, or on the screw is so short, you can't get a lot of clamping pressure using one of these. So this is just for quickly opening and closing the vise, not for actually getting any kind of torque. So these vice jaws are pretty uh, open right now. They're at sort of the extent of their travel. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use the speed handle. There we go, nice and fast. Okay, get it close. Um, so side one goes up. You know what, these Sharpie marks aren't very visible. Let me, let me see if this paint marker works. Okay, hopefully you can see that a little bit better. So side one is going to be facing up. So that goes right there, oop, there we go. Now, you know, I, you don't wanna just let this sit on the bottom of the vise like that, okay? Um, you really wanna have it up a little ways, uh, especially because right in the center of the vise right here, uh, there's just a, like a big opening, right? So uh, also because if you ever like drill something um, you know, then you really need a little bit of space underneath the part for the, uh, the drill to go through. Uh, and also the parallels, or sorry, <laughs> while I'm giving it away, but um, the thing we're gonna use are called parallels and they also help us to know that the part is situated correctly. Anyway, so we wanna stand the part off just a little bit from that surface. So we're gonna use parallels. Parallels come in a big box like this. You can see that they have a bunch of uh, different sizes here. They should be reasonably well labeled. This one is actually, you know, all of the parallels in their correct location and they look fairly, you know, in good condition. Um, I'm not gonna say that that's always the case, okay? Um, so how, how big of a parallel do you need, right? How tall should they be? So these vices come standard with jaws that are one and three quarters of an inch high, okay? Um, and here you really want to hold on to as much as you possibly can. So you want it relatively low in the vise because that'll increase the clamping pressure. Um, but you need it high enough so that you can get access to all the material that needs to be removed, right? I mean, that's kind of obvious. 
So we could go just with the smallest size, which is this little half inch right here, and let's see what happens. Close it down most of the way. Okay, and that looks pretty good. Uh, there's just one problem. At some point, we're going to want to measure this, uh, this block, right, in order to get it down to its uh, roughing dimensions. And so if it's only a half inch, we're not going to be able to get the calipers down in there um, because the, the, the head on the caliper here, these, actually this fixed jaw right here, is just too wide to fit in between the, the bottom of the vise and the parallels, okay? So we need to at least get uh, parallels of a, a minimum size so that we can fit the calipers in there. And actually, when we get to measuring with a micrometer, um, you know, the amount of room that we need might actually change. Maybe we, we need uh, less, but more likely we need more because the micrometers just require a little bit more room because uh, they have that little C-frame with the anvil on it. So uh, really, I think that in this case, we could go with, uh, well, let's see. That looks like it's just big enough, right? I think that would work. Okay, so let's go with this one. This is the uh, 5 8 So again, just like the vise, you really need to make sure that these parallels are clean. You can wipe them off. You can just wipe them off with your hands. Just make sure that there's no schmutz or chips or anything like that on there. Okay, side number one goes up, down on the parallels like that and close it up. No need to like hammer this down or anything at this stage of the game. We kind of don't care where exactly this is sitting because there are no precision surfaces on here. So as long as it's down on the parallels for the most part, that's fine. Um, and then as soon as we cut this surface, then we're gonna start caring about how exactly this sits in the uh, device or on the parallels, right? Now I'm gonna switch over to this regular handle right here, this vice handle so that I can put some good torque on here. Okay, good vice pressure is important. Um, too much vice pressure can distort the part, but this part is really pretty hefty, uh, so I'm not concerned about it distorting at all. Uh, notice that I put the part in the center of the vice. If you put it off to one side, remember that the fixed or the, uh, the movable jaw can actually move around a little bit um, to conform to a part that has two non-parallel surfaces. Well, if you put the part over here on one side and clamp down on it really hard, it's gonna cock out a little bit because it's unsupported over here. And then you're only gonna be like pinching the part here on this outside corner or on the inside corner. And then that would cause the part to be badly supported, right? Um, and it actually could shift around as you're cutting it. Anyway, so whenever you can, put it in the center of the vise there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move this over. And actually, it looks like I'm gonna have to drop the knee a little bit. Okay, here we go, on top of the part. Okay, now I'm gonna bring the, uh, the cutter down to touch the surface with the quill. And I'm gonna be gentle with it because I don't want to damage these inserts, right? If you bring the inserts down too hard, you can chip them. Actually, remember, these are already pretty much destroyed. Um, but let's just pretend. So I'm gonna bring it down with the quill just until it touches. Actually, maybe I'll move this over. Let's see it a little bit better. Okay, bring it down just until it touches like that. And then I'm gonna lock the quill down. Now I'm gonna go ahead and zero out the knee. There it is, it's a zero. So we just created a zero reference where our cutter is touching the part. Now I'm gonna back the knee off one full revolution just to get the cutter off of the part so that when I move it off of the part like this to my start position, I don't drag the cutter across the surface and damage both, well, in this case, we don't care that much about the part because this surface is gonna come off, but you could very well damage the inserts, right? Now I'm gonna bring the knee up that one full revolution. And so now we're back to that position where my cutter is touching the top of the part. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a cut. Okay, so for my start position, I'm going to move over in this direction, basically so that one third of my cutter is off the part and two thirds of the cutter are on the part, okay? 
Now I'm going to set my feed rate by moving the table away from the part and slowing it down or speeding it up until I get the desired speed. So I'm looking for 11 inches per minute, which is right there. Okay. Now I can move the cutter back into position. Last thing that we need to do is set a depth of cut. Okay. How deep of a cut can we take with this? So this cutter can handle about 70 thousandths depth of cut, 0 0.070, when it's clamped directly in the vise like this. Um, but uh, when we're like between the pins, then I would say uh, maybe like less than that, like 30 to 50 thousandths, okay? Just because it's not clamped as securely. But here we could take 70, but actually all we really wanna do is just clean up the surface. We're not gonna try to take too much material off of here, okay? So I'm just gonna go 20 thousandths. 0 0.020 here on the knee. Okay, that's 20. Let's go. Okay, stop the crossfeed. So I don't know how this is possible, but it cut an absolutely beautiful surface. Not supposed to do that. I mean, you saw how chunked up these cutters were. Uh, maybe it's because the, uh, the, the broken edges are on the side rather than on the bottom. Uh, if they were on the bottom, I bet they would give a, a much crappier surface finish. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and try that. I'm going to rotate these around so that the chipped edges are on the bottom of the insert, and then let's uh, take another cut. Engage. Now, one thing you'll notice is that when I come around this way, the chips are going to be coming out towards me, right? It's going to come out in this direction. So I'm just gonna use a piece of paper to kind of guide the chips around so that they don't land on me or my neighbor. See what I'm talking about? Those chips can be very, very hot. Now this is kind of amazing, but it left a perfectly decent finish. A little bit of chatter, but other than that, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Um, it should leave a very, very, very ragged edge as it's cutting, um, but somehow this is still cutting reasonably well. I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, let me go ahead and switch it out for the other uh, cutter that already has the good inserts in it, and then, you know, let's see what effect that has. Okay, let's try this again. Start the cut. Okay, I'm going to do a zigzag and I'm going to move this over. Again, one third on, or sorry, one third off, two thirds on. I'm going to use my paper to shield me.
See, one thing I did that I shouldn't have done is I left the dial caliper here on the table. Shouldn't do that. Now you can see that I, I put hot chips all over the dial caliper. That's, that's a bad thing to do. I should have removed that from the table. It's a sensitive instrument. Well, now this surface does look a lot nicer. A lot nicer. Um, the, the, the surfaces before with the messed up cutter, you know, they, they looked reasonably presentable. I mean, they probably would have passed. Um, but this is definitely nicer, much shinier. Um, and uh, so the way that you can tell that your head is in tram is, so going in this direction, you can tell if the head is tram uh, in, in terms of its tilt left to right. If the front of the cutter cuts a circle that goes this way, and then as the back of the cutter passes, it cuts another circle that goes this way. That means that the cutters are all at the same point, and you can still see both of those markings on here. In fact, let me show you that. So here you can see that there are cuts going this way, as well as cuts going this way. Okay, so we were tram there. And then to tell if you're tram in your nod, um, then what you want to look for is where the two cuts meet. Okay, so where like, the, the two cuts sort of overlay on top of one another. Um, so you can see that little line right there. It's inevitable that you're going to have some kind of like a little uh, a change in pattern. So you're always going to have a visible line. But what you're looking for is that there's no like lip, right? There's no step right there. And it doesn't appear that there's any step. Like with my fingernail, I can't feel anything. And actually, ideally, what you'd really like to see is for some of this cut to come around and you should be able to see sort of like both of those, both of these patterns overlapping right here. So it may be that we're just slightly out of tram um, or maybe that there's a little bit of tool deflection or something like that. Not really sure, but actually this is acceptable. Okay, so that's side number one done. Go ahead and uh, clean the surface off with a little brush. Actually, clean everything off. Clean the parallels off, top of the vise, everything. Remember, you know, caution. Only schmucks measure over schmutz. Cosmos. Don't forget that. Now, here's one issue that we've got a pretty serious burr now on the side of the part. And so we really need to remove that, not only so that we don't cut ourselves, but also so that the burr doesn't interfere with how the part um, is positioned on the vise. So let me go and hit that. I kind of like to, uh, you know, just do this with the part in the vise um, whenever I can uh, because it just holds everything a little bit nicer. I'm going to use a small file for this. Don't want to remove a lot of material. I'm going to orient this at a 45 degree angle, but we're not going to put like a big chamfer on it, right? We're just trying to get the, just trying to get the burrs off, break the edges. It's a little bit easier to get control on this thing uh, if it's in the vise than if you're holding it in your hands. Uh, that's all it takes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and remove this. Okay, so that's my side number one done. Okay, now we're gonna flip it around so that side number one goes up against the fixed jaw, right? And I could just go ahead and write that back in there just so I have a reference, that's side number one. I'm not gonna use the paint pen because it actually took a while to dry. Okay, so side number one right there and we're gonna do side number two. Okay, side number two is perpendicular to side number one. So because our fixed jaw is the surface that we can trust, I'm gonna put side one up against the fixed jaw and then close this movable jaw up against side number four. Now here's the issue, right? So right now, side number four are not parallel. Side number one and side number four are not parallel to one another. Um, so if we were to just clamp them, then they would be kind of fighting for supremacy in like where exactly the part is sitting. But we want side number one to be sitting on the fixed jaw and be perfectly vertical. Because if side number one is vertical, then when we cut side number two, 
it's going to be you know, horizontal, and they will have a perpendicular relationship to one another. Okay? So we want to ensure that side number one is a thing that's um, taking uh, priority here over side number four on the movable jaw. So we're going to introduce a pin in between side four and uh, the movable jaw. Okay? So something like this, just a copper pin, or actually brass, brass pin. Open this up. It's sitting on the parallels right now. And then we're just going to put the pin right there, just like that. And we're going to give it good vice pressure, OK? You can really crank down on the vice handle because uh, you know, we're only going to be touching a single line of contact back here. Uh, and so we have to be careful that uh, this thing doesn't come out of the machine when we're um, machining it. Uh, and this is also why, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to take a smaller cut with the Octomill. We're not going to do our 70,000. I mean, we weren't going to anyway because we just want to clean the surface up. But you know what I'm talking about. So we are on to number four on the project planning worksheet. And that's mill side two. Just like we did before, going to bring the tool over. I may need to move. Am I going to be able to get enough clearance? Yes, there we go. Move the cutter over top of the part and bring this down just a touch. Lock the quill down. I'm going to zero out the knee. Back it off one revolution so I'm off the part. Move the cutter off the part to the side. Back up to my zero with the knee. Plus another 20 thousandths is like a sort of minimal cut there. I'm going to position the cutter so that about two thirds is on the part, one third is off. Then I'm going to turn it on and take a cut. Okay, go ahead and make a zigzag. Okay, now it's going to be one third off, two thirds on, and take another cut. The chips are coming directly towards the camera. Turn the spindle off. OK, I'm actually going to wrap it considerably out of the way for this next cut. Clean off all the chips. OK, now going to hit that with a file again. Get rid of the burr. Now you can see that it cleaned up all the way. The entire surface cleaned up. And uh, you know it probably will, because uh, twenty thousandths is enough material to clean this up. But potentially it won't, right? Especially on like the bandsaw cuts, maybe it won't clean up all the way, and you need to take a, a deeper cut. You just take the minimum cut really that you need to in order to get a milled surface over the entire surface. Okay, relabel this number two. Remove the pin, and there's the part. So now we've got side number one and side number two. Okay, the next step, ooh, these got a little bit dirty, so I'm going to go ahead and clean these off too. The chips get everywhere. Somehow milling is a little bit less contained than 
uh, working on the lathe is. On the lathe, everything seems to just go down into the chip pan, um, but here the chips just get sprayed everywhere and they get into everything. So, yeah, it's, and you're making a lot more like setup changes, right? And so you really need to watch out for uh, chips more than you do on the lathe. So now we are on to step, step five, uh, which is milling side three. And it's important to note that uh, side three is parallel to side two, and we still want side number one up against the fixed jaw. So now side three is gonna be perpendicular to side one for the same reason that side two is perpendicular to side one. And side three is gonna be parallel to side two because side number two is down on the parallels. So let me go ahead and position that right there. Okay, go ahead and force that pin in there. Lock it down, good and tight. Now here we can see that these parallels are still moving around, right? I can still move the parallels around, which means that the part is not sitting down on the parallels, okay? And we really want it to sit down on the parallels because that's how we're ensuring that side two is gonna be parallel to side three, right? So again, uh, we have to use our precision machinist's hammer. And you're gonna to wanna to move the part well away from the uh, milling machine head uh, because the worst thing is that, you know, you come in here, you start whacking at things with the hammer and then you start knocking off bits from the head and breaking screws, okay? So we're gonna use a dead blow hammer just like this one and give it a couple wraps. Sorry folks, not really sure what happened here, but the audio cut out um, during this section for some reason. Uh, basically, all I'm doing here is hitting the part down on the parallels so that the parallels don't move. And then I'm setting up for another cut, a little skim cut of 20 thousandths on side number three. And then I actually take that cut. Okay, we're going to do a zigzag. Engage the cut. Okay, move that part well off. Okay, there we go. Looking pretty good. Okay, so since now we have two opposing machine surfaces, we can actually finish this down to our roughing dimensions, okay? So in this direction, it's gonna be our two inches, 430 thousandths. Um, so let's go ahead and see what we've got right now, just with the calipers. So that says two inches, 450, just about two inches, 450 thousandths, two inches, 451, let's say. So two inches, 451 minus two inches, 430, uh, is 21 thousandths of an inch. So I'm going to take another cut uh, on this surface of 21 thousandths, and that'll get me down to my 2 inches 430. So with the knee, I'm going to move the, or the crank, I'm going to move the knee up another 21 thousandths. That's 10, 20, and 1 on the dial. Turn it on again and go for the gold. Position the cutter a little bit closer. All right.
Okay, make a zigzag and engage it in the other direction. So go ahead and hit this with the file. After a while, you're going to, you know, just develop these calluses on your big meaty hands from handling parts so much. Like burrs don't really do anything anymore, but I, you know, I still get cut sometimes. Okay, so there's that. Let me just make sure that we came out to the size we needed. Yep, so there we go, two inches, 430 something. It's good. Relabel that number three. And now, oh, this got dirty too. Now we are going to move on to side number four. That's step number six on the project planning worksheet. So now side number one, our sort of reference side, goes down onto the parallels, okay? We're going to clamp between sides two and side three, like so. Oh, still a little bit of schmutz in there. Get rid of all that schmutz. Now, since we've got one, two, three machine surfaces, we don't need this pin anymore. And we should be able to tamp this down on the parallels. So move it away from all the sensitive bits on the head, give it some gusto. Okay, this parallel's not moving, this parallel's not moving. Okay, we're down. All right, so now we're gonna do the same thing that we did before. This should be a familiar refrain to you. And position the cutter. So we're gonna go over top of the part here. Come down with the quill nice and gentle-like. Lock that down. I'm going to zero out the dial on the knee. Okay, back it off. Come off the part. Go back in my one revolution and then 20 thousandths. Turn it on. One third off, two thirds on. Engage. We always want to clean up the surface. Uh, so we want to get that mill scale off and establish a surface that is uh, square to the other ones. And also we want to cut it in place and take a measurement so that, you know, just like on the lathe, we can link up a position on our dials with a position with a position on the part, with a size on the part, right? That way we can just take a measurement and, um, you know, however much more we have to go, we know that we just need to go that much further on the dial in order to get there. Turn that off. Wrap it off the part. All right, let's take a measurement. One inch, 900 and like 39 
something like that, 1 inch 939. Okay, so 1 inch 939 minus 1 inch 910, which is going to be 30 thousandths of an inch over our final size in this direction. So 1 inch 880 plus 30 is 1 inch 910. And so we're going to go 939 minus 910 is 29 thousandths of an inch, which I'm going to take all in one go. We're going to come around for a second pass here. Okay, so I, right now I'm at the 20 mark, so I'm going to go another 29 from there. So that's 30, 40, and 9. So now I'm at 49. Turn it on. One third off, two thirds on. Engage the cut. Let's go ahead and take a final measurement now while it's still on the machine. Ideally, you'd want to do it on the machine. Yeah, so we ended up at 1 inch 908 or something like that. Yep, and that's just fine for roughing. Yeah, two thousandths of an inch off our mark without having to try too hard. Relabel that side four. Okay, let's pop this out. So that's sides one, two, three, and four done. So now we just need to do sides five and six, the bandsaw cut surfaces. Now the issue with this um, is that we can't just put side five up like that and cut it with the octomill because that's going to guarantee that it, it will be perpendicular to whichever side is uh, up against the fixed jaw, right? But side five is not going to be perpendicular to uh, either of these sides, right? Because it's actually going to be sitting on the parallels on side number six, which is just a band, bandsaw cut surface. So we know that those two surfaces are not perpendicular to anything else. So what we need to do is hold the part so that all of the finished surfaces are square to the machine and then cut side number five so that it is perpendicular to those four surfaces. And the way we're going to do that is by actually putting the part off one end of the vise so that a little bit of it, of it is exposed right there. Okay, just like that. Hit it with a hammer. Okay, parallels aren't moving, good. And uh, then we're going to do this using the high-speed steel end mill. Okay, remember I mentioned in the lecture portion of this uh, project that we we're going to use the side of the end mill. And so we're going to cut the side just like this, just like that. So we're going to cut the uh, surface, um, side five, in the vertical position. So that's, that's a little bit different than what we've been doing so far uh, using the Octomill. And this is going to be held in one of those R8 collets. It's a three-quarter inch shank. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. So let's go ahead and remove the Octomill, uh, and I'll show you how to do that. And then, uh, and then we'll put this in. Okay, so to remove a tool, first thing you want to do is just move that uh, quill all the way to the top. And that's going to expose the draw bar uh, on the top of the spindle. Okay, so engage the brake and then back that draw bar off. Not all the way, but just so that it's loose, right? So I can feel that it's loose in there. Right, so it's still engaged in the thread on the back of the uh, tool holder, um, but it's loose now. But you can see that the tool is still rigidly held in the spindle because the two tapers are so closely mated. So we're going to have to um, convince this tool holder to pop out of the spindle. And for that, again, we're going to use our precision hammer. Okay, so just go ahead and give the top of the draw bar a little tap. All right, doesn't take much. Okay, and then now you can see that it's rattling around, but it's still captured, right? Because the draw bar is still engaged on the threads on the back side. So now you can hold the tool holder and back the draw bar out by hand. You can see it's getting more and more and more loose. 
until at some point it just pops right out. Okay, there we go. So what, what do I mean by drawbar? Let me pull this thing out of here. This is basically just a long screw that goes through the, uh, through the spindle, as you can see. So it's got threads on the end of it and a long uh, cylindrical bar section, and then it's got um, you know, uh, hexagonal wrench flats on the top. And then that threads into the back of the tool holder here. So we can make that happen. All right, you can see that that's, that's really what's holding it in. So that's all it's doing. It's just pulling the tool holder up into the, uh, the spindle taper. Let me go ahead and put that back in there. Boink. Okay, you can even feel it down there at the bottom of the spindle. Okay. Here's the thing with this high-speed steel cutter. Um, so the collet is going to get pulled in by the drawbar, um, and so we're not worried about that falling out. But since it's just friction holding this tool in, I mean, it's this uh, cylindrical shank and the clamping pressure of the collet holding this thing in, as soon as we bump the collet out of the taper, um, the tool is just going to come right out. Right? And then it's going to land on, you know, it's going to land, uh, well, well, now that we have these nice um, uh, table covers, uh, it's less of an issue. Uh, but still, uh, this is going to come out and it's going to land on something, potentially something hard and damage that thing and the tool. I mean, these are pretty fragile tools. Uh, so you really want to uh, just put something underneath the spindle in order to catch this. Uh, so uh, you can also do it maybe like over top of the vise, but put like a, I don't know, uh, some paper towels or something like that down. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put a paper towel down here. The other thing is that these end mills are kind of sharp, so you kind of want to hold them with a, uh, you know, with a shop towel anyway. Okay, make sure this is all nice and clean. Find that keyway or that key, whatever's left of it. Go ahead and pull the draw bar up. Okay, so it's it's nice and in there. Okay, then I'm gonna grab onto this end mill. Stick that in there as well, and start cranking down on the draw bar. Okay, so at this point it's it's in there, but not very well. So I'm gonna keep that shop towel down there just in case it decides to pop out. Okay. Crank on it a few times. Okay, nice and tight. Very good. We're ready to go. Okay, so let's go ahead and move the table over so that we're close to our cutter. Move the table that way. Okay, and so, uh, you know, obviously I need to go down a little bit or I have to go up with the knee. So I'm actually gonna try and be as close as possible to, uh, to the end of the spindle there. So I'm gonna lock that quill down and I'm gonna move the knee instead of bringing the quill down because uh, that's gonna give me more rigidity. The less tool is hanging out, the more rigid this is going to be, the less vibration we're gonna have. I'm going to move it kind of close here. And I'm really just trying to adjust it so that I'm within the, um, you know, basically so that this, these flutes will cut this entire surface. And uh, the length of this tool is just about two inches. Just about two inches. It's supposed to be two inches flute length. Looks like it's just a little shy. Hmm, okay. So we'll see if that actually covers the entire surface in one go. This is something I maybe should have checked first. It looked like it was close. But uh, the, the issue is that as these wear, uh, we actually send them out to get reground. And then as they grind, because they grind the ends of them, uh, as well as their, the outsides. And so they get shorter and shorter and shorter every single time. It actually looks like we're just going to make it. Just going to make it. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put this into low gear. 
Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the RPM is because that's something that you should have figured out uh, when you did your project planning worksheet. But I'm going to go ahead and set it now. Make sure that it's spinning the right direction. That is the correct direction. Adjust the speed. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the table over into the cutter. There we go, just until I touch. Then I'm going to zero out the digital readout. For the X direction. Okay, then I'm going to move off, move the part over, go back into where I touched off, and then go in maybe another, uh, let's do 20 thousandths of an inch, 0 0.020, and then I'm going to lock the table down on the X axis so that it doesn't move around on me, and then I'm going to feed by hand, right? Now, feeding by hand, uh, you know, it's, it can be difficult to set a consistent feed rate, but the digital readout will still read a feed rate. It's just going to be, um, well, it's just dependent on how, fed you, how fast you feed it by hand. I'm also going to give it a healthy dose of coolant as we go, like so. And uh, let's go. So about two inches per minute. Try to be as consistent as you can. You can see that the chips that come off look completely different than the chips that come off of the um, Octomil. Kind of long and slender. Okay. And turn this off and then let's check something out. So if I try and clean up this surface, makes a bit of a mess, huh? Okay, did we clean up that entire surface? Uh, yeah, it looks like we did clean up the whole surface in one cut, all right? So a lot of times what happens is that the bandsaw cut is just really out of whack relative to the other surfaces. Uh, and so, you know, you'll, wherever you touch off, um, you know, you might clean up like maybe down here or maybe up here, maybe you clean up on this side but not on this side, so you just have to, keep taking cuts until you clean up all the way across. And here we have uh, a fully clean surface. So this is really what you want to see. If we were going to take another cut to clean this up, there's a temptation to just, you know, move the table over to the new depth of cut, clamp it down, and feed the part back going the other way. Uh, but you should fight this urge. Uh, and it has to do with something called conventional milling versus climb milling, okay? Conventional milling is what we want to do. Uh, conventional milling is what we just did. That's where the part starts over on this side of the cutter. Cutter is positioned on the right side of the surface, and then we're feeding the part in this direction. Okay? So think about this. The cutter, uh, the cutting edges are coming around like this because we're spinning clockwise, right? And the part is getting fed in this direction. So really, the direction of the cutting edges and the direction of the part are opposed. Okay? That's as opposed to climb milling, where you actually start on this side, uh, cutter is over here, right? and then the part is feeding this way. The cutter is still feeding the same way also, because it's always feeding uh, or always rotating clockwise regardless. Okay? And so in now, though, they're actually feeding in the same direction. right? They're feeding in the same direction. Um, so, actually, climb milling has some big benefits. As you can imagine, there's less cutting pressure, uh, and so tools tend to last longer. Uh, you know, it takes less power to, to feed the table around. The only problem, though, 
is that on conventional machine tools like this one that use traditional lead screws, uh, just like on the lathe, there's a lot of backlash or slop between the nut and the lead screw that actually feeds the table. And so when you're feeding the, um, you know, when you're climb milling and the cutting edges are being fed in the same direction as the part, there's a tendency for the table to sort of shudder around inside of that backlash, inside of the slop. And that will uh, totally damage the surface and potentially even damage the cutter. Um, so for mach uh, conventional machine tools, we don't climb mill, we conventional mill. Meaning that again, the part starts on this side, tools over here, and then the, the feed of the part and the feed of the cutting edges are opposed to one another. Okay? Um, and that's just so that it, the, the part always or the table always is loaded to one side of the, of the threads in the lead screw. So if the cutter were over here on the left side, uh, then in order to get conventional milling, the part would have to start uh, over here and feed this way, right? Because cutter is still coming around clockwise, okay? And then the part would have to get fed against that direction of rotation. Uh, and if it started over here, like we're doing actually right now, right? then this is still the direction of rotation. Now the part is being fed in the same direction. Okay? So everything would be reverse if it were on the left side. But we're not on the left side, we're on the right side. Okay? So for conventional milling, we're going to start part away from us and feed it towards us. Okay, let's get this thing out of here. I'm going to go ahead and unlock the table. Move this over. I'm going to put that shop towel back down there. All right. Back off the draw bar. Grab the tool and another shop towel. Smack the draw bar with the hammer. There we go. And then that should just pop right out. Now you can see there's some, some dirt in there. I want to go ahead and brush that out. Now the collet should come out nice and easy. And there we go. Octomil goes back in, just like that. Lock that down. Okay, gonna lower the knee a little bit. Move the part out of the way. Okay, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to file this one in place. Make sure that's all nice and clean. Go ahead and relabel it. That's side five. Okay, so uh, we are ready to finish this thing off. So we're going to do side six. Make sure all these parallels are clean like so. Okay, so uh, we're going to do side six now. It's the final side. So now we can put uh, side number one back up against the fixed jaw and side number five can go down directly on the parallels. Because we machined side five so that it was uh, very perpendicular to the existing four machine faces, now when we set that down on the parallel and machine side six, then side six should be very perpendicular to the original four sides also simply by virtue of being very parallel to side five. So let's see, the parallels are still a little loose here. Let's give it a little wrap. Okay, good, nice and tight. Actually, let me clear some of this stuff off. We don't need all this stuff. Okay, move the table down. So again, this is, you know, the fifth time that we've done this together or something like that. Just for the sake of variety, uh, let's use a different touch off method for side number six. Um, so, so far we've been using something called a static touch off. Uh, which means that we touch off on the surface that we're going to cut and set our zero when the tool is not rotating. 
Now, I like using this method because uh, it's quick and easy and you can comfortably use the quill to set the distance. Um, the other reason that it's nice is that you don't cut the material when you touch off, right? So you don't really run the risk of uh, removing material in the process of touching off, which of course would change where your actual zero was, right? Um, but there are some negatives here. One is that you can chip the tool uh, when you chip the cutting edges when you touch off, if you touch off too hard. Uh, and the other thing is that there are four inserts in here. And, you know, the inserts are made with a relatively close uh, tolerance in terms of their size. And the seats that they're sitting in are manufactured so that they're, you know, they hold the inserts in approximately the same position, um, but not perfectly, right? And so really what we'd want to do is spin this thing up so that whichever insert is sticking out the farthest is the one that touches off on the surface, right? That way we can guarantee that the lowest point of the cutter is what's actually touching the surface. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Uh, it's just a different way of doing it, okay? So let me show you. So let's go ahead and bring this down with the quill, and we don't, you know, we just get it close, okay? We're not actually gonna fully touch off there. I'm gonna uh, lock down the quill. I'm gonna put this into high gear. There we go. Turn it on. 1400 RPM. Okay, now with the knee, I'm gonna bring this up just until we pull a chip. Okay, there we go, I can hear it. Here you can see right there that we touched off on that surface. We're not cutting everywhere. Okay, we're only cutting right there. But that's where I'm gonna set the position on my knee. So that's zero. And I'm gonna set it for 20 thousandths as I have been doing this whole time. Okay, I position myself for the cut and then take the cut. So that's a dynamic touch off. There's not a whole lot to it. There are some subtle pros and cons of each way. Okay, cut the other way. Turn it off, wrap it away. We'll take a measurement right now with a dial caliper. And that's telling me two inches, 170. Two inches, 170, okay. Uh, and in this direction, I'm gonna go down to two inches, 160. Okay, so I only need to take another 10 thousandths cut. Now, if I had actually cut this to two inches, 250 thousandths, um, then I would probably have a little bit more material to go. There we go, 10 thousandths on the knee right there. But since this uh, particular uh, piece of scrap that I grabbed was just a little bit undersized, um, I don't have to take as much. So it actually worked out in my favor. Here it is, the last cut, folks. By the way, folks, this was, uh, so step number five was the one that we did before uh, with the, with the high-speed steel end mill, and this was just, uh, sorry, so that was step number seven was with the high-speed steel end mill, and step number eight is the one that we just did, milling side six to two inches, 160 with the Octomill. And that should be it for uh, the cuts that we did. Let me go ahead and just label this side number six just so that we can have all the sides labeled. And 
And you really need to make sure that it's deburred. I mean, don't just go through the motions. I mean, actually use your fingernail and check for burrs. Okay, looks good to me. So that was side one, two, three. Oh, some of this has gotten rubbed off. Side four, five was the end mill surface, and then six. So now uh, we already checked all the sizes. Let me just double check those sizes. So we've got two inches, 432 right there. We've got uh, two inches, 159 right there. And then let's see, in this direction, we've got one inch, 908. So that's all fine and good for the size of this thing. Um, but remember that we weren't just trying to get uh, the part down to its roughing dimensions in terms of size. We're also trying to get this thing squared up, right? So we also have to inspect for square before we move on. Um, so to check for parallelism, that's relatively easy, uh, just with a caliper. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is measure uh, between the surfaces, but we're gonna measure in a few different spots, here and here, here and here here and here, here and here. And now what we're looking for is not necessarily the absolute size, but rather we're looking for readings that are very consistent, right? They should be very similar to each other within a few thousandths of an inch, really, using this method. And that one was pretty close. So let's try this, this direction as well. 160, 159. Uh, 159, 158, okay, so that's pretty good. All right, let's check the other direction. Uh, two inches, 430, two inches, 432, two inches, uh, 426, okay, two inches, 424. All right, so there's a little bit of variation there. Um, and uh, we would prefer for it to be less than that, but I think we're gonna be okay. In order to check for perpendicularity, we can use this machinist square like we use when we're tramming in the head. Remember, this is our known 90 degree reference between the base here and the blade. So you can just go ahead and put the base up against any surface and bring the blade down so it contacts a supposedly 90 degree perpendicular surface. And then all you're really doing is looking for uh, any uh, inconsistency in the gap um, between this surface here that you're measuring and the straight edge or blade, right? So you just want that gap to be uniform all the way across. And you just do that with all of the surfaces, okay? Just do that with all the surfaces, um, and then that's how you check for perpendicularity. Right? Now, I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but it should be pretty gosh darn close. Anyway, so as long as this passes that sort of simple rough inspection, uh, then we're done. And we're ready to move on to uh, drilling the hole and, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> drilling the hole and uh, removing all this excess material with the bandsaw. Okay, but that's the next video, part number three of the demonstration. And I'll see you then. Thanks.